I always wait until the choir gets down. One, because I can talk to all the boys and be respectful. You let everybody else get out before you get up. Uh, but I was uh, <clears throat> serving on staff at a church where I was uh, one of the associate pastors. I was pastor of the students and missions. And so the, the, the whenever the pastor was out of the, the pulpit, he would allow me and then another one of our associate pastors to, to preach. And so uh, I remember one Sunday where I, I preached and I went to the choir, got out. Actually, I, I don't say I was preaching that night. But that, that morning, our uh, other associate pastor, who was a pastor of uh, education and, and administration, as soon as the choir hit their last note, he jumped up there and never gave missed a beat, just kept on going. And I think he was through preaching before the choir got through getting down. And so uh, we didn't let them hear the end of it. And so I learned my lesson, uh, be respectful and you, you wait. So that's what I, I always want to do. Well, uh, since Dan mentioned that uh, Cheryl Arsenal, uh, the Be Thou My Vision, was one of his favorite songs, was also one of Meredith's favorite songs, as soon as I got back to my seat after our fellowship time, uh, Meredith asked me a very good question, and she asked it in a wonderful, wonderful way. Uh, she basically said, you know that song was played in our wedding, right? <laughs> I'm so glad she asked that way, because she said, you know what's special about that song? I would go, uh, no. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it is a good song. I'm glad she chose to have that song in our wedding. I just remember, wish I would remember more about the wedding. Uh, I was more interested in getting out of the church, getting on to more important things. Uh, but we had, uh, what a great time to reflect upon the fact that our marriage is to reflect on Jesus and make sure that Jesus is the uh, primary point. Well, uh, two things I want to pass away before we get into our message. I don't want to spend too much time on these because we got a lot of material to cover tonight. As you notice, we're going to look at four chapters. Uh, this is more of a survey. We're going to move quickly uh, through these four chapters tonight. But uh, before we get into that in Exodus 24, and go ahead and turn your Bibles now. Uh, one is last Sunday night after uh, we left this service, I went on to uh, Fayetteville, Georgia for the Georgia Baptist Convention. And some of you might be curious as to what took place. Uh, was it a good convention and all that? Uh, it was a great convention. There was not one uh, bit of conflict or controversy that came up. The, only, the, the probably the most exciting thing that came up was the fact that your pastor rolled off of the, the Committee of Order and Business. And so now I'm free. Uh, but that's probably the only thing that, that I could say really was uh, exciting. But it was just a, 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 a good time of of preaching and worship. Uh, but then when we came to the business of the convention, we were all in agreement. Uh, there was nothing that was uh, controversial, nothing that was uh, voted on. Uh, no business was brought up from the floor. And uh, I, I, I tell everybody, if I'm trying to, to make some friends within the, the pastoring community around here, uh, I've been telling them that this is a big change for me because coming from Tennessee, uh, they like to fight. Uh, I don't know what it is, but if, if there's an open mic for, for any type of open business, someone's going to bring something up, and they're going to have all kind of boo. But uh, it was a good time. I'm glad we got to have that, that time of, of uh, worship and business through the Georgia Baptist Convention at our annual meeting. One more thing I want to bring up to your attention uh, before we move into our message, and that is, is that uh, your staff is working on having uh, what we're calling the 2020 vision. Uh, next year, uh, when January 1st hits, we'll be moving into the year 2020. And so we have a vision that we uh, want to implement here at the church, and we're just calling it the 2020 vision. We want to see clearly the things that God has for us. So we came up with 20 goals that the church can accomplish in the next year. Uh, the goals are, are a stretch, but they're not so far a stretch we can obtain them. Like the very first goal uh, is to baptize 20 new believers in the year 2020. And so, uh, is that a stretch? Well, when you look at the fact that we've only baptized just a couple of people in my first year here, you say, that, that, that sounds impossible. Folks, we ought to be baptized for well over 20 every year. So I believe that we can do 20 baptisms next year. But we're gonna, it's going to take everybody. You're going to need to be witnessing. You're going to need to be embodied. You need to do your part in this, uh, leading people to the Lord so that they can become disciples, followers of Christ. 
Uh, we're going to uh, work on the building. There, uh, we have a, a display out in the foyer and down the hallway of things we want to see accomplished here in the church. Well, this is the year. Let's get them done. We need to paint the walls. We need, to, we need new flooring here in the sanctuary, the foyer, the, the hallway. Uh, this building is still as beautiful as it is. It now needs some maintenance. And so let's not talk about getting it done. Let's do it. Let's get it done. Uh, we want to have a, a larger presence in the schools here in Grayson. Uh, we want to reach families. We want to increase our attendance in worship, in Sunday school. We want to increase our, our our, our budget given. Uh, we want to uh, uh, in grow the choir. Dan has given specific numbers of what he wants to do as far as growing the choir. Uh, so we, we have all these things we want to do. But one of the things that I also want to point your way because I'm extremely excited about the, the main one is the first one, and that's highlighted in red, and that is the 20 baptisms. We, we want to we want to baptize a whole lot more than what we're doing right now. But another thing that I've been working on for a while now is a uh, Starting in January, uh, I'm going to preach through the Bible. Well, each Sunday or each month, or 12 months, right? So I divide the, the, the Bible up into 12 sections or, or chapters, if you will. If you say that the Bible is, is, is one book made up of 66 books, let's just say it's one book, and, and I've given it 12 chapters. And so each month, uh, probably the first Sunday of the month or somewhere in that range, we're going to look at that section. And so uh, I figured that would be a fun way for us to learn the Bible in a chronological way. But as I, I got this, this idea to do so, this is back in, in July, I said, that's, that's not enough. That's only a portion of what we ought to be doing. And so I began then, back in July, coming up with a Bible reading plan so that we as a church can read through the Bible together. And that will go in conjunction with the, the messages that I'll be preaching. And so the, the very first one will be in January, and it'll be looking at uh, Adam and Eve all the way to Noah, and then it also includes the book of Job, because I believe Job probably came sometime between Noah and Abraham. And so he'll be included in that, so we'll read, uh, was it the first 11 chapters of Genesis plus the book of Job. Then in February, we'll look at Abraham through Joseph. March will be Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. April will be Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and a portion of 1 Samuel. And so when we're looking at these sections and how this all fits in, but each section and each chapter that I'm calling them of the Bible, each, all 12 of them point to Jesus Christ. So we're going to see how they all tie in together. And when you uh, take your Bible and you read through those and and you have uh, uh, first and second Kings, first and second, second Chronicles, and then you move into uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, which actually take place later on. And you're like, how does all this fit in? This Bible reading plan and the sermon series will help put all the pieces and how they're kind of sort of fragmented in your in your Bible. It's going to put a more in a chronological way of reading them so they they make sense. So I'm excited about that. I hope you get excited about it as well. Uh, some of you may have never read through the Bible before in a year. Uh, this will be a good opportunity for you to do so. It's, a, it's an a, a opportunity for us as a church to walk together through the Bible in this way. So I'm excited about it, and I hope you get excited about it as well, because God's Word uh, has the power to change lives. We're going to let it do so as we read it together. Well, uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Exodus 24. We're going to look at, as Dan pointed out, uh, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And I'm glad he picked up on my hand. I didn't have to tell him to sing that song. He just picked it up. So good, good job, Dan. Uh, that is the theme to these four chapters. And there is a theme verse. It's found in chapter 25, verse 8. I believe that verse uh, summarizes or is the theme to these four chapters. So in Exodus 25, verse 8, it says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And so we're going to look at how God desires to dwell among us and how you are his sanctuary. Now, that's not what he's saying in these verses that we're going to look at. They're going to build up a physical place to be his house. But through the blood of Christ and our relationship with God now, you become 
the sanctuary. You are the place where he dwells. So we're going to begin tonight looking at chapter 24. Uh, and we begin with the order of worship. That is what is found there uh, in chapter 24, verses 1 through 18. The order of worship. Let's look beginning in verse 4. It says, And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he arose early in the morning, and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, this is what the people said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Now, here we begin by looking at Moses made preparations to worship. Uh, worship requires the very best we have to offer. We, we have to give God our very best. And that includes when we gather ourselves to worship. Let me ask you a question. I don't want you to raise your hand or, or nod. Uh, this is a question between you and the Lord. Did you prepare yourself for worship tonight? Did you prepare yourself for worship this morning? Or did you just simply get up when the alarm clock went off? Did you uh, get dressed and put on your, your clothes and, and just run out the door? Did you prepare your heart for worship? Uh, that, that is what he calls for us to do. We are to prepare to worship the one true God. So I, if you would say, yeah, I didn't really do anything special. I, I just did what I normally do. I didn't really say any preparations. I want to pause for a moment. I want to give you an opportunity just to pray and say, God, forgive me for not making this more of an important aspect of my life. I want to give you my very best. And I prepare myself to come into your presence. So just take a moment and just pray and get along with God and prepare your heart for worship tonight. Father, we are unworthy to come into your house. We are unworthy to come and gather together to worship you. You are high and lifted up. And we don't always bring you our very best. So please forgive us. Please forgive us of all of our sins. But in this context, forgive us of not treating worship as respectful as we should. So Father, we pray that as we gather tonight, you have examined our hearts. Father, we want to give you all that we have. We want to worship you with all of our heart, with all of our beings. And so we now prepare ourselves for worshiping you, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, God Almighty. And we thank you for the opportunity to do that. We pray this in the wonderful, powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as we, we look at this, this aspect here of, of giving God our very best, and preparing ourselves for worship, next, a large part of our worship is giving back to the Lord. We, we give back to Him and we uh, make sure that we are putting or giving Him our very best as well. Not just your attitude and how you come, but your tithes and your offerings. I wonder how many times we just put a, a, a little token amount into the offer plate. Maybe it's to be seen by others. Maybe it's because that's what mom and dad taught us to do when we were kids. Maybe it's because we know we're supposed to do it, but we do so grudgingly. But we need to realize that we need to give God our first fruits. Uh, that is the very best we got. That means we need to give even sacrificially. 
so that uh, he is uh, pleased with our worship through giving. We also see in verse 7 that the sermon came from the Word. It came from God's Word. It was not Moses' Word. It was God's Word. He opened up the, the covenant. And that's what he began to read from. And then, and not only that, but the, the people were responding to the message. Folks, if you just come and you just hear a, a, a word and you're not changed by that, then either I did a very poor job of giving you, you God's word, or you did a very poor job of preparing yourself and not opening up and listening to what God has to say to you. Uh, and I, I know the work that I put in, so I'm going to say it's probably the latter. All right? We need to listen to what God has to say to us through God's Word. And whether it is a, a Rick Gage or a, a guest evangelist or your pastor or Brother Jeff or whoever it is we have to come and, and preach, come with a prepared heart to listen to what God has prepared for you so you can respond to it and leave change. We are to, to become molded to the image of Christ. Other people should notice a difference in you when you have met Him. And so, respond to the message that's been delivered to you. In verse 8, we see that worship results in a covenant between us and God. It's a natural response for us to, to hear God's Word, to respond to God's Word, and say, God, I am committed to You. Because you have committed your son to me, I am committed to you. I am making a covenant. I am making a promise. I am making a vow. I love you with all that I've got. And I'm going to worship and serve you and live for you. Now we see there in the verse that we read that as they make this, this, this covenant, and as they are responding to the word, Moses takes the blood that's been offered up to, to God. And he sprinkles it on them. Now let's go back. We studied this back earlier in our, our look at Exodus. When they took the blood of the lamb and they painted it on the lintel or the doorpost of the house. What did that represent? That was a representation of the blood of the come of Jesus Christ. This right here is now reminding them of that very thing. It is to remind us that we are sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. I often ask the question, have you been touched by the blood of Jesus? Has Jesus' blood washed you white as snow? That's exactly what he's doing right there, is to, to let them know the blood that will be shed for them for the remission of their sins. Jesus Christ, and he alone, is the only one who can take away the sins of the world. Okay, as we move on now to chapter 25, we look at the order of our offering. Now, we talked about offering being a part of worship, but it's also just something that he brings out specifically in verses 1 through 7. In chapter 25, verse 1, we read, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they may bring me an offering. From everyone who gives it willingly, with his heart, you shall take my offering. So he tells them to do so willingly. Now, we know from 2 Corinthians 9 and 7 that God loves a cheerful giver. God wants us to give because we love Him. Because we know that He can do so much more with our, our money and our gifts than what we can ever do with it. And yes, we are to, to take care of our family. And yes, we are to save for a rainy day. And yes, we are to put aside for retirement. And there's all these things that we need to take care of. But first and foremost... We give back to God. Why? Because it shows our trust in Him. It shows our dependence on Him. And it shows that we know that when we give Him our 10%, He blesses us and we can do a whole lot more on the 90 than what we ever could have done on the original 10, 100%. That it shows our dependence and our trust in Him. We are to be faithful in our giving. We also see in verses 3-7 through seven that we're not going to read that we are to give God our very best. And so we are to give Him our very best as we make preparations for worship. We don't come in slothfully. We don't come in uh, lack, lack, like a daisy We give Him our very best in our worship. We give Him our very best in our tithes and our offerings. 
I mean, we had an opportunity to do so this morning, and I hope you, for those of you who are here this morning, uh, here in this hope, I hope you gave through the love offering. And you didn't just go give because you were entertained. You gave because you heard the gospel proclaimed through song, and you know it will touch someone else's life. And music has a powerful impact. Music has a way of speaking to people, uh, especially those who are unchurched, that maybe a preacher won't have. And so you had an opportunity this morning to give. And if you didn't, well, it's not too late. You can still give. But maybe it's the next time. And the next time we have a group come in and we have an opportunity to give through a love offering, you need to give God your very best. Don't just give some little $1 bill and say, well, that, that, that'll give them to McDonald's. No, it won't. I mean, not only will not give them to McDonald's, it's not going to further the kingdom of God. So give God your very best. Now, we always pray, God, we pray you multiply this offering a hundred times over. And he has the power to do that. But he also looks at you and says, I'm asking you to multiply a hundred times over. I'm asking you to give so that uh, God's work can, can continue on. All right, well, as we move on here in uh, chapter 25, and this will go all the way through the the remainder of the portion, all the way into chapter 27, we look at the order of the tabernacle. We're going to look at some common themes that take place in, in these chapters. We're not going to obviously read all the verses. We're going to hit the highlights, and we're going to begin with the ark. The ark is the first thing. It's found in verse 8 of chapter 25. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you make uh, shall make it. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold inside, and you shall overlay it, and it shall and shall make on it a molding of gold all around. Now, it talks about making a pattern, but we know that more as a blueprint. He is telling them how to build the place of worship. And so we begin with the ark. And the ark is to be a dwelling for God. This is where God's spirit is going to rest. He's also giving them meticulous descriptions. And it tells us that God is very meticulous. Think about your own self. Think about your physical body, your emotional being, your mental capacity, and all the things about you. Not, not just the, 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 the skin and bones that you can see, but even the things that you can't even see within you. And think about how meticulous God was when He designed you. How special He made you. You know, as I'm looking around right now, I, I don't know, I'm not here right here, I, I'm, I'm going to guess probably maybe 50. That may be a pastor guess. I don't know, a preacher guess. But whatever it is we have in here, I don't see a single person who looks identical. Now, there are some who are father and son or mother and daughter. They might fade in one another, but there's no identicalness. You know, unless you're maybe an identical twin where I would have a hard time telling you apart. Every one of you is, is different. And that's because God specifically and specially made you. And he did so meticulously. Uh, and he has a plan for you. And so he did the exact same thing as he was telling them how to build the tabernacle so they could worship him. After we the ark, we see the mercy seat on the ark. Now, if you've never seen a Raiders of the Lost Ark, if you've never seen a, a picture of the, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, basically it was a, a big box that was gold all around. And then on the top of the box it had these cherubim, which were angelic creatures. They are uh, beings that we can read about in the Bible. Uh, and they, they had their, their wings. And on the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the angels were facing one another and had their wings stretched out to touch the, the tips of their wings to one another. And that tip right there where the, the cherubim were seated, seated on the ark and their wings touched one another. That was known as the mercy seat of the ark. And that is God's dwelling place. 
So let's read about that in uh, chapter 25, verse 17. And you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammer and work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end, and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it, one piece, with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and the ark you shall put in the, the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in the commandment to the children of Israel. And so once again, just as he told them how to build the ark, he's now telling them how to build the, the, mer the mercy seat, the resting place of God. And he does so with great meticulousness. I mean, he is telling them in detail how to build the place where his spirit is going to rest. And why? It's because it's going to be the dwelling place of God. That's where his spirit is going to rest for them. Then we see the table for the showbread. The table for the showbread is found in chapter 25, verses 23 through 30. It's to be made of acacia wood. It's to be covered in pure gold. He gives specific measurements. It's going to have uh, ornate details all around it. Uh, it's going to have pure gold accessories on there. And they're going to put 12 loaves of bread uh, each week on the table of showbread. And the priests were allowed to eat from this table. This was the, the offering that was given to, to feed the priests there and uh, the, the, the children of Israel. And this bread that was now being placed on the table that the priests were allowed to eat for nourishment was a representation. Why? Because just like when Moses sprinkled the blood on the people to represent the blood of Jesus, this bread is to represent Jesus. We know him as the bread of life. Jesus Christ is all we need. He is the one who is able to, to sustain us through our time of need. And so he is the bread of life. Then we have the, the gold lampstand. That's in chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. Again, this is to be made of pure gold. It's to be handcrafted. And we'll have ornate details. It's all one piece. There'll be no soldering or welding, much like with the mercy seat. Uh, uh, there, it is to be molded out of one piece of gold. Uh, it is, it's going to have a shaft and branches and bowls. Ornamental knobs and uh, almond blossoms have a pure gold wick trimmer. In verse 39 we read, And it shall be made of a talent of pure gold with all these utensils. And see it, or see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. God said, don't deviate. I'm telling you how to worship me. I'm telling you how to build this. I'm telling you, don't deviate. Don't go rogue or do it the way it feels right for you. Gosh, how many times do we hear that take place in church? Well, I, I go to church where, where, where I like it, right? It feels good to me. I like the, the, that style, that music, that preacher. I like it. And, and what we make worship is all about me. It's all about what I like. Folks, God is telling us right here. What about what He wants and what He likes? God will tell you where to go. God will tell you where He wants to use you. God has is, is, is blessed us here in what we call the Bible Belt, which probably has no more to do with the Bible than any other place in the world. But at one time in, in this life, uh, the South was, was vibrant for the things of God. And, and, and conservative in our theology. Now, that, that's changed a lot. But there are still churches on every street corner. And every church represents the body of Christ. Well, that tells us that every local church needs every body part. Because we make up the body of Christ. 
Some are eyes, some are mouths, some are feet, some are hands, some are, are other vital parts of the body. Every church needs the vital parts of the body. And so listen to God. God is the one who's going to tell you where He wants you. God's the one who's going to tell you, I need your, I need you to be that specific body part in this local body so that they can function the way I want them to function. Instead of going where you want to go or what you feel comfortable with, well, this is where I've always gone. That pew over there's got my name on it. Uh, uh, this is where I, I grew up. This is, is a, where I feel comfortable. This place is, is listen, we could come up with a thousand excuses because we've heard them all. But the one place we need to be is where God wants us to be. So he tells us here in the, the making of the lampstand, it's basically to look like a flowering almond tree. We know this as the menorah. Here in a, a few weeks, as many of you begin decorating your houses for Christmas, and you go into stores to buy Christmas gifts or we buy more decorations, you will find some menorahs because the, the, the Jews of this world celebrate Hanukkah and it's represented by the menorah. Well, this lampstand, the menorah, reminds us that Jesus Christ is the light of the world and we are to reflect his light. We are to be the salt and light in this world. Well, when we move now to chapter 26, we look at the tabernacle. Verses uh, 1 through 37, they give us the blueprints that we have here. Uh, he tells them to make 10 curtains of fine woven linen with blue, purple, and scarlet thread. They have 11 curtains that are made of goat hair, a covering of ram skin that's dyed red for the tent, and then a covering of badger skin above that. Could you imagine coming to church here this evening in a tent made of all these curtains, goat skin, and badger skin, and ram skin, and all that? Well, you got to remember, this tabernacle was really a tent. It was made to be movable. And so they would uh, uh, tear it down and move it, and then they'd set it up in another place. Uh, but these tents, or these curtains that they're, they're make, making here, amount to coverings that would drape over the tent. And they serve multiple purposes. Part of it is for decoration. You know, these beautiful curtains that are made of scarlet and blue and purple threads. Uh, they were to be for decoration. They're also there for protection. Uh, the, the badger skin, the, the animal hides we use for protecting from the elements. Uh, it to be a roof and a cover. It also would give privacy on the inside. And so there were multiple purposes as why God's telling them to build it the way they did. The studs of the, the, the tabernacle were to be made of acacia wood. The joist hangers would be made of silver. Once they get the studs, they would be overlaid with gold. Uh, the temple veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and a fine woven linen. And then there's an ornate door made of acacia wood, gold, fine linen, and bronze. And if you move down to verse 33 of chapter 26, it says, And you shall hang the veil. Remember the veil? The veil that was rent to the day that Jesus died. You shall hang the veil from the clouds. Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider. A divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the holy and the most holy. You shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand across from the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. And you shall put the table on the north side. When God's telling them to build this tabernacle. In very descriptive terms, very ornate, very meticulous, this temple veil is separating the holy of holies, a place where God's spirit rested, from the outer courts of the, the tabernacle where the people gathered. 
Even where the priests would gather. Let's remember what Jesus did when he rent that temple veil to He removed all that so that we had direct access to God. We could approach Him through Jesus Christ. In chapter 27, we see the altar of burnt offering. And that is uh, verses 1 through 8. And that is where they would go and give God their sacrifices. They would give God their sacrifices for their sin offering, for their peace offering. For all the things they would bring to God, that's where they would take that offering. Then in verses 9 through 19, we have the court of the tabernacle. And this is where the people were allowed to gather. They were not allowed to go behind the temple bell of the Holy of Holies. I'm so glad that, that God changed all that. God himself did not change, but he allowed our approach to him change through the cross. And what happened that day at Calvary, he allowed us to have that personal relationship with him where we could come into his presence. That's why we sang that song. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Yes, we pray that the presence of the Lord gathers when we gather together as his people. Folks, let's remember where the tabernacle is now. Where the dwelling place is now. That's the heart of His children. When you invite Jesus to forgive you for sins and become Lord of your life, you are inviting Him into your life. And that is now His dwelling place. And that's when that song should take more uh, importance. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. We want to have that kind of relationship with Him when we are overwhelmed and excited to have His presence in our lives. And then we also see uh, here finally tonight as God's given them now a description and how to build and do all this, He tells them the, the care of the lampstand. How to take care of this, these idols of worship. In chapter 27, verse 20, and you shall command the children of Israel that they shall bring you pour a pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. In the tabernacle of meeting, outside the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall tend it from evening until morning before the Lord. It shall be a statue forever to their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. Now, Wayne, I have a, a, a diagram there. I'll go to the next one. I know y'all can't see that. I put it on there anyway. I know you can't see it. Uh, I, I have one in my notes here as well. But that's kind of an artist rendition of this very detailed description of how to build the tabernacle. What I find, and I, I, I've seen drawings like this, I've had maps like this in my Bible, and it's, it's very, I, I think it helps. But this past year, I got to go and stand by two of these locations. One was the temple that Solomon built. And I was able to go and stand right outside the wall, which is the closest to the, the Holy of Holies there uh, at the, the t temple that Solomon built. And it was, it was special. Uh, I was prepared for it. Uh, I was told by some, some friends who had gone before me that that was just a, a monumental moment for them. They got to come up to the wall that would have been on the outside, would have been the closest place we could possibly get to the, the Holy of Holies of that uh, original temple that Solomon built. Uh, and, and, and how special that was. But then just a, a day or two later, I was able to go to Shiloh. Shiloh had so much more of an impact on me because there were no walls. There was nothing hidden. And there in Jerusalem where Solomon built his temple and then, and then uh, King Herod built his temple on top of Solomon's temple. Uh, and now there is a, a Muslim mosque there on top. You're, you're below ground, and it's in a dark 
not dark, but it's what's well lit. If you're in a tunnel and you can't see on the other side of the wall, when I went to Shiloh, it is wide open. And you can see for miles and miles. But what is so important about that spot is seeing where this tabernacle, the tent of meeting, where it rested for over 400 years. And while we go to a, a lot of the sites in Israel, they would tell us, we're about 90% sure this is where it was. Or, or maybe we're, we're not really sure, we, we're taking a good guess this is where it was. They're 100%. 100% sure that this place of Shiloh was exactly where the tent rested for 400 years. And so as I was there that day, and we go, we, we do a tour of the place, but it ends, our, our, the last thing we do there is we go up, and we are now in, if you look at that, that map there, we're kind of in the, the court of the tabernacle, or somewhere out there, we're, we're, we're just out uh, in the, the large gathering area. But they tell us, we know exactly where the Holy of Holies was, and we know exactly where the Ark of the Covenant would have been because of the foundation walls that are, are, we have found. And so they have 100% certainty. They know exactly where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the mercy seat was, where the Spirit of God rested for 400 years. And when they allowed us to, to go and just reflect on our own, and I shared this tonight that I did my presentation from Israel. I walked up, and, and they, they had a roped off. You're not allowed to go into the, the place that would have been the Holy Holes. And I was able to go and stand with my legs up against that rope and just lean in. And as I was standing there, realizing where I am, the fact that God told them to build this tabernacle in this way and do it exactly as I say. Don't deviate one bit. And this is where I am going to rest. This is where you are going to worship. This is what you are going to do. I just came overwhelmed. I had experienced uh, a relationship with God that, that, that I had. Not because that place is any more special than this place. Not because of any other thing but the very fact that I am getting to, to talk to God in a place where He rested for 400 years. And I was just overcome with emotion. And I, I wept. <coughs> but the thing that I want to remember from that, and I can't wait to go back again this next May and take some of you with me. And there's still time if you still want to go and you want to experience a place like Shiloh and Please let me know. I, I want you to go. I want you to experience what I experienced. But as special as that place was, God looks at my heart and your heart as just as precious. Yes, Israel, the, 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 the physical location of Israel is a place that He chose. And He promised it to His people. And yes, He chose the people of Israel to be His people. But He also chose you. You may not be living there in that holy land. And you may not have Jewish ancestry. But God says, I declare your heart, my dwelling place, is just special, just as precious. So when we gather together to worship Him, especially in a corporate setting like this, let's remember that we, as His children, need to give God our very, very best. Because that's what God wants. He doesn't want your leftovers. He doesn't want your used items. He wants your very best. I remember Cody, when I was a new pastor, it was kind of the running joke with, with all of my, my new pastor buddies that we all had uh, couches in our youth room. We all had some type of furniture in there. But you know where it came from? It came from some grandma's bedroom or den or whatever because she was ready to get rid of it. She was ready to buy some new stuff and gave us the hand-me-downs. And, and we all joke about that. Like, 
Yeah, we see where we fall. We're not good enough to get the good stuff. We get the broken stuff. I wonder if God says that sometimes. Do we just give God our, our leftovers? Or are we giving Him our very best? God wants our place of worship. He wants our, our place to be the very best. So that means we need to confess our sins and, and repent of our sins. And then also, as we think of the place of worship, God wants our place of worship to be our very best. That's why on uh, number three on our list, these aren't done in, in the, the order of, of importance except for number one. Number one is the most important. Number one is the, the baptized 20 new believers. That, that is priority one. The rest of them don't really fall in any type of order. They're, they're kind of just uh, randomly selected. But number three on our list is to paint interior walls, new flooring, and hopefully, prayerfully, Brother Dan, as you share with me, reconfigure the platform and the choir loft of the, the worship center so that the, the choir can have a more functional area. All that sounds, that sounds monumental. But isn't God worthy of that? Isn't God worthy of us giving our very best? And when we look at the, the talent sheet out there in the foyer of what we have, what we don't have, what we still need to accomplish, let's just remember that we're trying to make our place of worship the very best. So we give our very best. I want to end with just one thought. And it goes back to the idea of the place of worship. You know, I'm sure everybody in here knows, if not, I'll tell you. Uh, I, I grew up in the city of Memphis. And I'm very proud, very proud of where I grew up. Best barbecue in the world. Right now, we've got one of the top football teams in the country. Top basketball team in the country, my alma mater. I'm, I'm so proud of all that. Well, when I was growing up, I, I attended uh, Ridgeway Baptist Church. That's where uh, I was called to the ministry. Uh, that's uh, my home church. They licensed me to the ministry. They, then they ordained me to the ministry. And, uh, great, great memories there. Well, I've got some friends who they grew up at Bellevue Baptist Church. You might remember a man by the name of Adrian Rogers. Yeah, he was pastor there. Uh, R.G. Lee was pastor there. Uh, had some other great uh, men and women come out of that church. Well, when I was growing up, they were located uh, in a not so safe part of town. In fact, uh, Clark, during our men's prayer breakfast, you talked about R.G. Lee. And you were telling a story about uh, when R.G. Lee was preaching back in the days when they didn't have the air conditioning, they had to open, just open the windows and the doors, and there was a prostitute standing outside on the street corner, and she heard the gospel, and later, the next day, she came in and got saved. Well, all the way through my childhood and teenage years, I guess, yeah, probably my teen, teen, teenage years when they moved, up until that point, there were prostitutes and drug deals and all kinds of stuff going all around where Bellevue was located. So they decided to move out of that unsafe area to a, a much safer part of town. Well, this was one of the, the first mega churches in our country. Uh, up there were First Baptist Dallas and some of the other churches that were just gargantuan in size and attendance and all that. Well, they built a brand new facility that was incredible. It still is. I mean, it's Oh, well, I, I couldn't guess. Probably 30 years old now. It still looks like a brand new. But it was so fancy. It had so many bells and whistles that it was located right on at, at I-40, Interstate 40, and Appling Road, right there as you're coming in from the, the east side of Tennessee going into Memphis. All the truck drivers had a nickname for the, the, the facility there. They called it Six Flags Over Jesus. Because it was just big, Wow, I mean, it's just all that kind of stuff. And when you walk in there, they're foyer, they're, they're atrium there, and they're beginning the front of the, the building. It is huge. I mean, I bet their foyer is, is every bit as big as this sanctuary right here. And it had the, at, at one time it had these grand staircases that kind of wrapped around. Well, after they finished this building, they had it completed. And 
and people began to, to worship there instead of their old, old location. A lot of the other pastors and, and members of other churches began to be very critical of Bellevue. Why would they spend so much of their resources on this building? Why would they go into all that when they could have given it to missions or they could have given it to whatever? As I read my Bible, God doesn't want us to give second best. God doesn't want us to, to make it cheap or chintzy. Yeah, they spent a lot, a lot of money on their facility. And here it is 30 years later, and it's still one of the most glorious places I've ever laid my eyes on. They did it right. And I believe God's blessed because of it. Let's not give God our second best. That's in, yes, in our facilities, but also in ourselves. Give God all that you have. Give God your very best. And I believe He will bless you in return. We don't do it to be blessed. I believe that's just one of the great perks of being a child of God, is that He chooses to bless us in a variety of different ways. And so just be grateful that you get to be one of the children to receive His blessings when you sacrificially and humbly come before Him and give Him your very best. Father, we thank You for giving you, giving us Your very best, and that was through Jesus. What He did on the cross is something that we couldn't do. The fact that you sacrificed him for us, we would never do for anybody else. But you gave us your best. So Father, I pray that we do the same. And if there's anyone here tonight that's never given you their hearts, where you want to dwell, Father, I, I pray that we do so tonight. If there's anyone here tonight that's not your child, tonight to get right with you. But Father, there may be someone else here that's already made that decision to trust you, to follow you, to be your child, that they're just giving you second best, or third best, or worse. Father, I pray that tonight we make a commitment. A commitment to give you all that we got. To trust you, knowing your ways are perfect. To be faithful. So God, I pray that as you speak to us, we are listening. And just as we read in our early verses, we respond to your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand for me here this evening tonight as God has spoken to you.